yeah, I will give the floor to you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the kind oh. introduction. <clears throat> Why is it that we people are able to sense each other's intentions and beliefs? And what would it be like if self-driving cars could sense the intentions of pedestrians? And could playing a card game like Hanabi help in developing this? Welcome, my name is Bram Grote, and in the next 25 minutes, I will show you how to build an AI for Hanabi, and hopefully pass some of my acquired knowledge of deep reinforcement learning onto you. So I just painted a picture of the long-term goal, the long-term reasons for why we're working on this, but this project also had a short-term personal goal as well, of course, and that was to gain a better understanding of deep reinforcement learning. Now, as a quick reminder, what are we talking about when we say deep reinforcement learning? It is a subfield of AI that combines the strengths of deep learning and neural networks with the methods of reinforcement learning. How do we then gain a better, experience, a better understanding of deep reinforcement learning? Well, by answering these two research questions. So that's what we're going into today. First, we're going to look at the theory, the mathematics behind a couple of important algorithms, and then we're going to put it in practice. How do we implement them, specifically for Hanabi? So first, I'll give a quick introduction about the game, Hanabi. Then we'll look into the three algorithms that, that I've worked on in my project. Then we go into the experiments that we've done to get the implementation working, and uh, we conclude. All right, so let's open up the box. How do you play Hanabi? Hanabi is a cooperative game with from two to five players where you work together to try to score the highest score possible. And the goal, you do that by building fireworks or these stacks of cards. Uh, Hanabi, by the way, is the Japanese word for fireworks. So that's why you see all these fireworks on the cards as well. And so the goal is for that for each of the five colors, we have to start a stack with a one, we'll put a two on top, all the way up to five. And if we finish all five colors from one to five, we've scored the maximum score of 25. So there are 25 unique cards with each a rank between one and five and one of the five colors. And there are also some duplicate cards as well. And the trick, the twist of the game in Hanabi is that you can't even see your own cards. So we're very used to seeing our own cards in card games and, and not the cards of everybody else. But this game is the other way around. So you see all the cards of all the other players around the table, but not your own. So you really have to work together to score well. OK, but how do you then, what do you do? So each turn, you have to do one of three things. If you either give a hint, so for example, I can hint uh, another player, you have three yellow cards, and then I can point at the cards. And uh, if I do that, I have to pay one of the blue life tokens. And so it looks like we can only give hints eight times. But fortunately, if you discard a card, so putting it out of your hand, putting it away, saying we don't need this anymore, then we get a hint token back. And of course, we can also play a card. So that is trying to put it on one of the firework stacks. So if I would try to play a red three card right now, that would be successful, and the score goes up by one. If I would try to play a red five card, it's not successful right now. So then we lose one of the three red life tokens over there. If we lose all these life tokens, then the score goes all the way down to zero, and the game ends. The game can also end in a perfect score, of course. So if we score 25, the game ends as well. But usually, the game ends when the deck is empty. So if you discard or play a card, you get a new one from the deck. And this happens a lot. So the deck goes down. If it's empty, every player gets one more turn. And then the score is counted by counting the amount of cards in the fireworks decks. All right, that's the game. Why do we play this game? Why, why is it interesting? Well, 
It's actually called a new frontier for AI by, by this paper from DeepMind uh, just last year. And they, they have a couple of good reasons for this. So first of all, it's multi-agent, of course. But most importantly, it's a cooperative game. So you have to work together, as opposed to many adversarial games that we know. In the real world, we also want our AIs to be able to cooperate well as, as well. It's partially observable, so you have to be able to work with imperfect information because you cannot see your own cards. And the hope is that this can develop a sort of uh, understanding of intentions, because that's if you play with, uh, with people, that's really, you feel that you need that. For example, if I would hint towards my fellow Serpentine members here that you have one green card, they know that I'm saying you should play this card. But we've developed this understanding, and the hope is that if an AI can play Hanabi well, it needs to develop this understanding as well. Okay, so a little bit about related work and the state of the art at the moment. It really depends on with how many players you play. So for three, four, and five players, the best results are still being uh, reached by rule-based bots. So that means they don't have any learning mechanism inside the algorithm. And um, yeah, they, they, they score pretty well, almost 25 on average. Only in the two-player domain, deep reinforcement learning uh, is, is the winner at the moment, scoring on average 24.6. But all these scores, and that's an important part, are in the self-play domain. So that means these algorithms are playing with copies of themselves, which makes it much easier because you can expect what the other players are going to do. What we really want to be able to do is play in the ad hoc domain. So that means that you are able to play with any kind of teammate, so uh, computer, other computer programs, or maybe even humans. And there have been, been some studies on that where a computer program, a rule-based one, played with humans. They, uh, they played with around 200 people and scored an average of about 15 points. So there's still a lot of room for improvement there. Okay, in our project, we're gonna take a small step and we're gonna work with the simplified version of Hanabi. So uh, instead of the partially observable one, we make it fully observable. So our agent is able to see its own cards. And furthermore, we restrict ourselves to the two-player setting and also stay in the self-play domain. All right, so let's go on to the algorithms. First, I'll give a short introduction on, on policy-based deep reinforcement learning, which all these three algorithms uh, are, and then we'll compare the three algorithms. So. How does that work? Policy-based deep reinforcement learning. It all starts with the policy network or the brain of the algorithm. So what does that do? As an input, it gets a current state of Hanabi. So this is the state of the game. What will you do now? So the, we put that in and as output, we get a certain probability distribution over the actions that you can select. So for example, you see here that the the third action has a pretty high probability of being selected. Well, and with this distribution, we then sample one action from that. Oh, for example, see, we, we now sampled play the fourth card, and we put that action back into the environment. And this gives off a new state and maybe also a reward. So in this case, we successfully played a card and got a reward of plus one. Now, this loop goes over and over. This new state gives a a new uh, policy, and you keep doing this to be able to play the game and, and gain, gain experience, collect the experience. Now that's nice, so we're able to play, but how do, we, how do we learn? How do we improve the algorithm? Well, it's the same way that we learn in our brains as well. We have to change the connections between the artificial neurons. So something looks something like this. And the hope is, that if we change these connections, that the, the policy will change in a good direction as well. So at first, the, the policy is, is quite random and very at the beginning, it doesn't really know what to do. And once we're learning, ideally, it looks something like this. So it becomes more and more certain 
on which action it wants to choose. So right now it's, it's pretty certain that it wants to play the third card. But how do we, how do we adjust these, these network parameters, these connections? That's the, real, that's the real question that we're going to look into in these three algorithms. So simple policy gradient. In simple policy gradient, uh, the, the network, what we just saw, is represented by the letter pi and all the parameters uh, by the vector, the, the bold vector theta. And the objective, so the goal of this, this policy network or this algorithm is to maximize the expected total return. And with total return, we mean the sum of all the rewards that you get in an episode, or the discounted sum in this case. And once we have this objective, we can take the gradient of this objective and use gradient ascent to update our parameters. Because this gradient gives us a direction to which you should change the parameters such that the objective value goes up. Well, how do we, how do we compute this gradient, the gradient of our objective? It's not that easy, but luckily there exists uh, an important theorem, the policy gradient theorem, that we, by the way, have, have proved extensively in, in our report. And it gives us a nice expression that we can actually use. And that is because all the elements in this expression is something that either we already know, which is the policy, we can compute the gradient of that, or something that we can estimate. So the Q value, which is the, the expected uh, total return that you will get from state ST taking action AT, we can estimate that with the experience that we have collected. And that estimate we call GT. So GT is in a certain state, how much rewards have I gotten after that state? So it all comes down to this algorithm, just four steps that you repeat over and over again until you're satisfied with the performance of your policy. So first, play a few episodes of Hanabi, play games to gain this experience with the policy that you have at the moment. Then compute these, these returns we just talked about, the GTs, and use that to estimate the policy gradient. And with this policy gradient, you can then update the parameters. By the way, this is really similar to the reinforce algorithm by, by Williams already thought of in 92. All right, on to the next one, vanilla policy gradient. So it might be a little bit of a funny name. Why is it called vanilla? Well, vanilla is like the most standard ice cream you can get. So this is also the, the most standard policy gradient uh, algorithm that we have. But it's, it's better than the, the most simple version. And what does it do differently? It actually has two networks. So not only do we have the, the policy network now, we also have a value network. And this network still has the state as an input, but notice that the output layer only has one node. And that's because this value network doesn't need to output a probability distribution. No, it only outputs one value, the value that it expects to receive after, after entering this state that you put as an input. And this is really useful to compare your, your experience. So for example, if while I'm playing and I'm in a certain state and I play and I receive seven points from that, well, that seems pretty good. But if our value network then says, well, we were actually expecting 10 points from here, then you know that the action you took was, was worse than you could have done. So we need to decrease the probability of, of taking that action. And in simple policy gradient, you don't have this comparison. So how does the algorithm look like? We still have the, the basic framework of simple policy gradient, these, these four lines. But now in step four, we add that we compute these advantages as they're called. So that's the difference between what we experienced and what we expected to get. And we now use these advantages to calculate uh, a more precise value of the policy gradient. And we still update the policy once, and now we also need to update our value network Notice that we update our value network more often, because, and that's for the reason that the, it needs to represent the value of the current policy. But this current policy is continuously changing, so the value network needs to keep up. 
All right, proximal policy optimization. On to the last one. A group of researchers from uh, OpenAI, just in the 2017, they, they noticed that when we adjust these policy parameters, the actual probability distribution that can, comes out can change quite a lot. And this can, can lead to some unstable learning in, in some environments. So they thought, well, what we actually want is that the new policy stays close to the old policy. We want to take careful steps in updating our policy. And they defined this as the ratio between the new policy and the old policy. If a certain action has a higher probability of being selected under the new policy than under the old policy, then this ratio will be greater than one, and that's okay, if it at least stays under 1.2. So we have to stay in this interval. And this interval can be changed, of course, according to the settings that you like, but this is the setting that we used. Now, how do they make sure that this ratio stays in that interval? They use a completely new objective function. So we previously saw the objective fun function from, from simple and vanilla policy gradient was to just maximize the expected total return. And PPO has a totally new objective function, which looks uh, very different. And it has this ratio inside and also this clip function, which makes sure that the ratio stays in the interval. Okay, so how does this algorithm look like? Well, we still play episodes to gain experience. We also compute these advantages. So PPO also has these two networks. And then we update our policy with the new objective now. And notice that we now also update the policy more often. And then for PPO, this is essential because you, if you only update the, the policy once, then this clipping operation will not be used because in the first iteration, the new policy is still equal to the old policy. So this ratio is always going to be equal to one and the clipping function won't be used. So we, we update five times. This is also a setting you, you might change to your liking. And then we also update the value function. Okay, so on to the experiments. How have we implemented this? Let's go to reward shaping. So these are the standard rewards of Hanabi. You get a plus one if you successfully play a card and you get minus the current score because the score goes all the way back to zero if you lose all of your life tokens. Well, we implemented this and we looked at the results and it didn't work. So something was going wrong. Well, what happened a lot was that our algorithms were taking illegal actions. So for example, if you're trying to give a hint while the hint token budget is empty, you're not allowed to do that. And then the environment gives back an error. So our algorithm couldn't go any further. So we had to work a way around this and we gave a negative reward for taking such actions. So now our algorithm also learns to avoid these illegal actions. And that was our first working algorithm. So we see uh, very quickly, just in the few couple hundred epochs, which is a loop, a whole loop through the algorithm, um, it learns very quickly to not take these illegal actions anymore. And then the score is zero for a long time, which means that it was just losing all of its life tokens. It couldn't figure out how to retain it. And then all of a sudden, it spikes up, it retains a few life tokens, and the score gradually increases. But notice that it's increasing like quite slowly still. This is like uh, 200,000 epochs, so that means 2 million games of Hanabi, and still it only scores five points. Humans score a bit faster. So we wanted to help it a little bit more, and think we thought, well, can we add some more reward shaping? Yes, we can. We have a lot of more options, uh, with, because we have some do domain knowledge. We know how the game works a little bit. So for example, uh, second from the last, discard a playable card. Well, that's just a stupid move to make. You could have just played the card directly, but instead you, you put it away. So we say, well, you get some negative reward for that. Try to avoid making that move. And with this, it also helps uh, the speed of the learning process. So without reward shaping, uh, the increase is, is very slowly, and with reward shaping, it goes up much faster. So we use this in our future experiments as well. 
onto exploration. We noticed that our policy was becoming deterministic-like uh, quite fast, and, and that is okay. Remember the, the policy distribution that we saw earlier. This is, this is what I mean with this is already quite deterministic-like, because it's pretty certain it wants to do one action. And that's okay if you're choosing the optimal action, but very often it, our algorithms were doing this while definitely not having the optimal actions yet. So, and this is bad because now it also doesn't explore a lot anymore. It's only doing this action all of the time and not trying out the others. So we wanted to stimulate this exploration by spreading out the, uh, the probabilities a bit more. And we've tried a lot. And, and the way that really worked for us was to use entropy to stimulate this, this randomness. Well, what do we mean by entropy? What is that? Well, informally said, entropy is like a, a measure of the randomness or the spread out, how much the policies probabilities are spread out. And if your policy is very deterministic, I definitely want to do this action, that means the entropy is low. And if it's more spread out, the entropy is high. So we want to stimulate our policy to keep the entropy high while still converging towards a policy that scores well. So how do we do that? We just add it to the objective function. So we take our old objective function, this could be the PPO one or the SPG, VPG, doesn't matter, and we add the entropy H of our current policy. We have to multiply this by a hyperparameter, a beta, that determines the importance of this term. So for example, if we would take a beta of 0 0.1, we're kind of saying, uh, still focus on scoring, which we find 10 times more important than, than keeping the entropy up, but also think about the entropy. So we, we experienced, we did some experiments with different values of this, this beta, which you see here. And the blue line with a beta of zero means that we're actually not using this entropy, and it's still one of the best. So that was a bit, uh, well, confusing, but we see that the green line is also doing pretty well, 0 0.01. So we, we wanted to look at some other metrics as well to decide what to go further with. And we looked at what is the actual average entropy of the policy during trading. And you see that without using this term, so the blue line, the entropy goes down pretty quickly. And if we do use entropy, so the green line, which is what we went for, it stays much higher for a longer time. So we used this, this entropy term as well. Now we did many more experience, uh, experiments, but I'm uh, going to skip ahead to what is the best agent? So this is the moment we're all been waiting for. What is the best algorithm? So before I tell you that, we've, we've tweaked some more. So we've added some hidden layers to make the networks a bit deeper. Uh, we renormalized the returns and we also used generalized advantage estimation and it all came down to this. So I'm now going to show you an animation of the training process. And we'll see simple policy gradient in blue, vanilla policy gradient in orange, and PPO in green. And you already see that PPO is shooting up quite, quite quickly. And it's still growing, reaching a score of 10 very fast. But there comes a vanilla policy gradient. and it reaches the level of PPO after about 100,000 epochs, it even surpasses PPO. And after, we're going all the way to 2 million epochs, by the way, after about half a million, PPO seems to have hit a plateau at 20 and not increasing anymore. So uh, vanilla policy gradient almost reaches this, this perfect score of, of 25. And we see that maybe if we would have trained for a bit longer, simple policy gradient might have uh, surpassed PPO as well. Now, we tested these final algorithms with a thousand games of Hanabi, and these are the results. So, simple policy gradient scored an average of 18.4. Uh, proximal policy optimization scored 20.5, with more than half of its games above 20. But the clear winner was vanilla policy gradient with 70% perfect games. All right, so on to the conclusion. Back to our research questions. 
what are the mathematical descriptions of the algorithms that we've seen? Well, remember these, these key points. Simple policy gradient only has one network, the policy network. Vanilla policy gradient adds a second network, this, this pol the value network, I should say. And PPO has these two networks as well, but it also has a totally new objective with the, the clip function inside. And two key things to remember when you're implementing a deep reinforcement learning algorithm. One is to stimulate exploration, for example, by using this entropy term. And two, to use reward shaping when you have some domain knowledge. And with that, we have a better understanding of deep reinforcement learning. And hopefully, we've set a small step towards these self-driving cars that are able to sense the intentions of pedestrians. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I think there's some time for questions. There are microphones uh, throughout the audience. They are on, so you can uh, just grab one of them and uh, shoot ahead. Please grab a microphone. Yep. Thank you for the presentation. Very elegant explanation of the, uh, of the algorithms involved. So incredible to see. Hey, um, do you have any intuition as to why proximal policy optimization performs worse than vanilla policy gradient? To me, it's surprising. So would you comment? Yeah, yeah, good question. It, it was surprising to me as well, because like I said, the uh, PPO was the, the, the newest algorithm of the three. Um, I, I'm not very sure about this reason, but uh, first of all, I should say these are only uh, one run of the algorithm. We haven't done a, like a statistical analysis by, by re redoing them. So it could just be a, a bad uh, random seed. But maybe a better reason is we started by implementing simple policy gradient. Then we went to uh, vanilla policy gradient. And at the end, I did PPO. Uh, and a lot of hyperparameter tuning was done in the beginning. So choosing which learning rate shall we take, uh, which uh, batch size shall we take. And it could have been that I've tuned that much more for simple policy gradient than vanilla policy gradient and then use those settings for PPO, while PPO works better with other settings. So that might have been it. Are there any other questions? Maybe from the chat on YouTube as well. Somebody, somebody can take a look at that. But Ilya, go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for a very elegant presentation. It was a very nice explanation. I, uh... Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I have one question. At the beginning, you mentioned that um, the game, the original economy game is partially observable. And I was wondering what is, like, how much more easier does the game uh, is when you have a fully observable state? A lot easier, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In the beginning, we, I even called it cheat mode because the goal was definitely to, to go to this fully observable uh, version. But uh, unfortunately, we didn't reach that in this, within this project. But um, yeah, I think it definitely makes it a lot easier. Because our policy network as an output, for example, it had only 11 nodes. So five nodes for playing the five cards, five nodes for discarding, and then one for just giving a random hint. Because the hints didn't really matter in, in our simplified version. And if you're playing the full version, you need to decide also which hints should I give, and th those are many options more. And also, if you're playing with more players, you even need to decide, okay, to which player do I need to give this hint? So it, it's really, I think, quite a, quite a big step to, to the full version of Hanabi. And the uh, current algorithm, when exactly? Um, so you have two players, right? Sorry, which, which algorithm? Uh, so this, this algorithm that you're using right now, so what, what you for your research with two-player games with fully observable, uh, fully observable state. Um, how do you decide on which, uh, which player takes the, uh, the action first, or do you decide for the whole, all two players at the same time what kind of action is going to be performed? Yeah, in, so in my implementation, we use just one policy network that decides for both players. At the same time? Well, it is a turn-based game, so yeah. first, yeah. Okay, so, the, so basically one step one player makes the game, uh, makes the action, and another step, another player yeah, makes the action. Correct. Okay. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Well, good questions. 
Right. Um, thank you for a very clear presentation. I honestly feel like uh, I learned a lot of new things the last half hour. Nice. Uh, um, just to get a bit of intuition, how long does it take to run two million of these iterations? <laughs> yeah, a couple of weeks. <laughs> weeks? Okay. Yeah. Wow. And I've, I've, I've used the, the high performance cluster of the TOE even. So it takes quite a while. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Or uh, Rick, I saw that you were looking at YouTube as well. Are there questions in the chat? No? That's fine. Mickey? Thank you, blah, blah, blah. Um, why did you choose on policy algorithms specifically? Was there a reason behind it? Or was that just the thing that you wanted to get familiar with? Could you comment? Yeah, it's a good question. Because uh, specifically because the, the state of the art that I showed is done with a value-based uh, algorithm, so a DQN. Um, but uh, especially my supervisor and I were interested in, in actor-critic algorithms. So that means you need to start with this policy-based. You need to have a policy network. And um, yeah, we, we went from there because, because of our interest in these actor-critic algorithms. All right, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, if you were, if you were about to move into more, um, yeah, bigger game, right? So partially observable, multi-agent. What kind of steps would you take in that direction? Uh, good question. Good question. So, first of all, we would need to uh, extend our our output layer of the policy network. Like I just said, we need to add these uh, possibilities of giving different hints to different players. And also, uh, the input, I would change as well. Because now we're only seeing the state, but this, this state in a partially observable uh, uh, way, this would change into an observation. Because you don't, you don't get the full state. You, you only see, you only get what you can see, which is like not your own cards. So you would need this observation, and you would probably need to add a, a belief as well. So a belief on your own cards, and maybe also a belief on what are other players going to do? That is, this is something that, that state-of-the-art algorithms uh, use as well. So those are the, the, the first directions I'm thinking of. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Maurice? Thanks. Thank you, Bram, for your presentation. I really enjoyed it, how you actually made it into a TED talk. Um, <laughs> so my question is about the learning speed and also possible extensions to a partial observable um, state. So can you comment on your ideas of if we should be scared of AI? And maybe that's a very stupid question, but if you think about the learning speed for such a program, what steps would you undertake to make it faster and make it able to really learn Hanabi well or actually be able to be used in autonomous driving and maybe other future possibilities that might end up in a negative? Whew, difficult question, but an interesting one nonetheless, yeah. So um, first about, uh, it was a two-part question, right? So what was the... So the learning speed and, and extensions to a full version Hanabi. Yes, so the, the learning speed, that's a good question. That's not something I would know on top of my head. Uh, I know that there are just these these uh, million dollar, trillion dollar companies that have huge data centers and and run it on that, and they get uh, great results because they have a lot of computing power, and so that would be an easy uh, step forward. And about the the second question, uh, should we be scared of AI? That's a really good question. I I don't know the answer. Uh, maybe we should, but. Um, I also hope that we can just keep AI uh, for good, that we can use it, for example, in self-driving cars. I'm really looking forward to having those in, in the real world. So that's what I would like to, to work towards. Also in my PhD, I'm gonna work on this. So that's, I hope that it turns out good, of course, yeah. But we can never be sure. Yeah, thanks. I, I like that you work on it, so I feel more safe now. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Okay, I guess there are no more questions. Otherwise, 
you can still ask. But um, oh, you do have a question. Yeah, please. Thanks, Bram. As a proud dad, <laughs> looking at your perfect presentation. Thank you so much. Um, what I learned from you, and actually what I also learned in life, it's about exploration and about uh, shaping rewards. It looks like educating people, uh, educating kids in, in the same way. Now, bringing, jumping to the, to the end objective in terms of autonomous driving, if you explore, uh, how do you prevent the risks which are involved in exploration? Yeah, yeah. Can, can you comment on that? This is a really difficult problem indeed, because in, in Hanabi, you can explore whatever you want because you're just playing a game. Right. But with self-driving cars, you definitely can't because you would drive over a lot of pedestrians, <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, definitely not good. But one thing you, you can do is work in a simulated environment. So you try to build a, 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 as, as good as possible of simulation of the real world and train in that and then hope, but this is still a really difficult step, to that when you're going from the simulated to the real world version, that the performance uh, keeps up. But by the way, we also used a simulated version of, of Hanabi by, by working with a program instead of the real cards. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but that, that is one solution that I know of. It, it's still a difficult problem. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you too. And, and be, be known that your mother is very proud. Thanks. Thank you. from the family and it's very nice that it actually happened today okay let me explain a little bit uh, uh, the procedure from here uh, yeah because we are in these uh, corona times yeah it will be difficult to fit all in my office um, so that's why we will do the defense here uh, defense is closed so we will ask uh, you to leave and and sometimes it, it will take a while so first we with the committee uh, and I should actually introduce them. So here's Michiel Hoogstenbach, uh, Maurice Poot, and Jelle Wemmenhoven, and together we are forming the committee. So we will ask Bram more questions about, about his uh, thesis, and we will um, yeah, take maybe about an hour for that. And then we ask a few epochs. A few epochs, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and then we will ask Bram to also go outside. We will discuss the grade that, that also usually takes some time. We ask Bram to come back and, and, and give the result. Uh, so all in all, uh, it will it will take some time. So maybe in Dutch also, gaan zo meteen over op de verdediging. Dat is gesloten, dus dat doen we alleen met de commissie en en met Bram. Vragen jullie dus ja om naar buiten te gaan. En het kan allemaal wel even duren. Dus wat mijn boodschap is, ja zorg dat je gewoon ergens lekker zit met een kopje koffie of waar je behoefte aan hebt. En Ja, na, na een paar uur dan, dan weet Bram ook uh, waar hij aan toe is. Maar het zal wel, het zal allemaal wel goed ja. komen. Er staat trouwens koffie klaar uh, net buiten, de, buiten die deur. Dus ja. die mogen daarvan pakken koffie en thee. Het is allemaal fantastisch uh, geregeld. <laughs> <laughs> ja. Oké, okay, uh, laten we Bram nog één keer bedanken, zou ik zeggen. En, en dan, uh, dan gaan we door. Ja. Dank u wel.